Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got some brand new news straight from G-Star, giving you the lowdown of what's going on with Guild Wars 2. We've got a discussion about game economies and crafting in Guild Wars 2. Stay tuned. It's coming right up. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting edition of Tales of Tyria. This is episode number six. It is the 13th of November. I am Bridger. I am your host for this evening. And welcome to another live edition. And if you're not here watching live, you're missing the fun and all the cutscenes and the outtakes and all of the things that get edited out. And since I have no time, that pretty much amounts to nothing. Uh, welcome to the show. This is your Guild Wars 2 podcast. We've got some great news for you today. But first, let me introduce my co-host. Spoof! Spoof! You got a sniper on, shooting at your head! Oh, that's your, that's your headset, it looks like. How's it going, man? I got nothing. Why can't I hear you? You know the music's still playing, right? <laughs> oh. I had the microphone on my mistake. Everything's going good. That's what the red dot was. <laughs> the red dot was uh, looked like a sniper rifle coming on your head. How you doing, Spoof? I'm doing pretty good. Tired, but good. Good, 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 good. Despite or because of the fact that you're being eaten by a shark. Oh, that's the best. Feels good. <laughs> Great's a robot. We got one guy perpetually being eaten by a shark, and <laughs> Vega, save us, bring us to normalcy. Yes, a normal room with a normal clothing. How are you doing? Now I gotta mess something up. I gotta do something. <laughs> you got a rug on the wall. Clearly, the that's. <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing All good. All right, welcome. We also have Gigawatt, again, still refusing to show his true face. Welcome to the show, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you. And joining us again as well. Thank you very much, Kai. Welcome back. All the way from the United Kingdom. Hello. All right, so let's start off uh, with. Just a few short stories of what we've been doing this week. I think uh, I like I like doing that. I like talking about you know what we've been playing, and then when we get to the game, we'll be able to talk about the things that we've been doing in game. So, um, anybody care to start? What have you guys been doing this week? I three streams oh. <laughs> mostly. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> oh no, you, 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 go, you go ahead. You started. You, you got to finish. Now. <laughs> oh, that's, I've been watching BF three streams. Uh, just writing, doing a lot of writing, trying to finish articles and stuff. I got a lot of backlog of topics I started for my blog that I never finished. So you're watching BF3 streams in lieu of playing it? I remember my computer got stolen, so oh, that's I right. don't have a, a way <laughs> You're until... experiencing oh, vic 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 vicariously. Yeah. All right, Vega, what you been up to recently? Anything interesting? Um... I've been playing. I I got Dungeon Defenders. Um, that one of looks my friends, fun. One of my friends talked me into it, and it's a it's a fun little game. You know, good good cheap fifteen fifteen dollar game. Um, but been playing that a little bit of Battlefield, and the past couple of days I've been playing Skyrim. Yeah, I have to say they're lucky that we've been able to collect ourselves here. What with Skyrim coming <laughs> out and all. Uh, yeah. All right, Kai, you've been doing anything interesting recently? Um, I've been trying to get more points in Hall of Monuments in Guild Wars 1, and I've been playing some League of Legends and Terraria. Today I started Terraria, which is really fun. I've seen a lot of videos of Terraria. I've never played it myself. But uh, as, as, as for me, I've been mostly playing a lot of Skyrim. I've been investigating methods through which we can improve the quality of the show here, and uh, that pretty much came up to many hours of wasted time today, but... I guess it's not wasted if I figured out what doesn't work, right? Isn't that what Thomas Edison said? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> that works. Middle All right, so accept that. that. Let's move right along then to the news for the week. Uh, we had two new blog posts on the on the main arena net blog the first one of course giving us some very interesting information discussing the changes that has uh, been occurred to the to the guild wars 2 demo for the g star convention in korea so they first discuss uh you know they had to change it to korean obviously would be very important korea is big big on mmos that's a, that's a pretty big market they want to tap but the more interesting stuff comes later on in the piece when we get to the character creation and customization. There's a lot more options available uh, than there had been previously. And uh, I have to say, uh, I am intimidated by the male uh, models in this. <laughs> that doesn't look like anything I could ever hope to achieve myself. But I guess that's why, uh, that's why we play games, right? They got some average looking ones in there. Oh, I like that. <laughs> That mustache. He had like the southern <laughs> <laughs> rapist mustache. I wonder if they'll let you do the Hitler. <laughs> I'm just curious. I wonder if that's Probably like not. something they specifically <laughs> prevented. Problem. The Hitler One mustache. One thing I did notice is like if you watch most of the videos, he starts off really manly and then goes like really female, and by the end of it, like the man looks <laughs> yeah. like No, woman. it's exactly what I'm watching the right now. The one at the end, I was like, That's wait, that. is that a girl? I could, I could see her chest. What, why am I looking <laughs> at her chest? Yeah. Oh my god, it's, it's totally so weird. Is. It's like wow. transsexual Guild Wars 2. That there just go. goes to show the power of this creation engine, though. That's amazing. So good. Like that, that, that right there, that, that, that's... It definitely looks like, um, Pat. <laughs> Not actually. The androgynous fellow... <laughs> And now, yeah. now it's ten-year-old boy. <laughs> I mean, like, wow, that's very, very well Yeah, now done. it's like ten-year-old girl. <laughs> and now, oh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So the other things that they talked about in the update here uh, were some UI improvements, and uh, the UI certainly looks a little bit more fleshed out. It's bigger. It has more information. Um, it looks, you know, sm slick to me. I don't see anything glaring about I, it. I don't like it. I think it's too fat. Too fat. Really? I love it. Well, the I question really is, like do you space. have... It's just bloated. Do you have this window open while you're doing other things? That's the question. Because mm. if not, then I, why I not like, use all the I space like that's the, there? Uh, the sort of like background of it, the sort of like paint, yeah. the sort of like brushy kind of dirtiness to it. But I could see why it, it's a little bit bloated and a little little big at the moment. They yeah. could they could strike it down. It could have this this section it, here could have been pushed in. But I like right but I like the layout of it. The layout I, I like. It's pretty you good. know sim simple and to the point. But yeah, yeah you got they could... armor on the left here. You've got uh, what looks like water water weapons on the left. You've got jewelry over here along with your actual weapon combos down in the bottom right. Interesting. Didn't they merge the um the bag into it too like as a tab on the left. Yeah, then the bag is also on the left. Yeah. I don't. I don't like that. I don't, think I don't know. I'll have there. to play with it to figure out if I like it or not. But I can see where yeah. it could be an issue. It's something that you won't really like be able to gauge until you actually play it and see how big it takes up the screen and whether you can make it smaller or not. And yeah, it's hard to tell yeah. if they cropped this image or not. Yeah, it's like yeah. you can't tell whether it's the whole screen or it might just be like a tiny yeah. corner of the screen, and then in that case, it might be small. So. Hard to tell. I just All think right, there's yeah. a lot of empty space. Oops. We don't it takes up a lot of space. Even if it is small, it's still a lot of wasted space. I is that because like the bags aren't full though on the left? Is could that be like bag space? I don't know. I think Hardly. that's bag space because it looks like that's it, it's showing weapons and then or arms and armor maybe, and then you have maybe crafting materials in a different tab. Although I have to say I I, I appreciate that sort of tabbed interface that has your stuff sorted automatically instead of having to, you know, get a special add-on to do it for you. Yeah, like, that's good. I like that. Yeah, it might be kind of deceiving because, like, we don't know exactly how big this is really going to be. Like, they might just be zooming in on, you know, this might just be a little tiny box yeah, I, in the corner of the screen like you could resize. Maybe one quarter or one third of the screen kind of a thing. Yeah, because in demos, like. I've seen them open the hero panel, and it's I've not noticed it to be very big. Like, I think I would have been like, whoa, that's really big. It says it's only a bit larger than before. 
Mm. So anyway, some of the meat of this discussion, though, is talking about how you learn new skills. Now, nothing really has changed about how you learn weapon skills since we've talked about that a while ago. Basically, if you have a sword and you've never used a sword before, your character, when you use the sword, will slowly unlock the other... Uh, you start with one skill and it'll unlock the other two skills for the one-handed sword as you go. And then if you switch to a different weapon that you haven't used before, you'll have one skill. And as you use that skill, the other ones unlock. And this is a very quick process. By the time you've, you, you've used the sword to kill like two or three guys, you've basically unlocked your second skill. And then third skill is another ten guys or so, and then you've got it. So it's not a, a grindy, you know, repetitive process. You get those skills very quickly, but... It's just there to slowly, you know, let you learn each skill one at a time, which I certainly appreciate. Yeah, I agree. So that has not changed. Yeah, that and it, it lets you learn the, f <clears throat> I was going to say that and it lets you learn the flow of the skills also. I think they said that they're trying to give them to you in an order that you would use them typically in when you were fighting also. That's good too, yeah. That's absolutely nice to, to see that they've put some thought into the order in which they are because I know in WoW I would always try to put my skills that I use in a specific order so I'd put my you know bleeding or, or damage over time skills up front so that I'd always hit with the dot first and then do the other damage skills after so those are the kinds of things that I used to do anyway now we talked about the weapon skills those are normal but uh, as you can see, here's some of the examples here. This is more of the same interface of, uh, of on a different tab here. So the other one's gear. This one is weapon skills tab. And now you can see all the different... You can scroll down and see all the different weapon skills that the player knows. And uh, next up, however, are the healing and utility and elite skills. This is a brand new system. You used to acquire these by training, by going up to a trainer and saying, hey, I want to learn something new, and they'd allow you to buy a skill. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, typical of most of these types of games. The new system, however, uses a skill point system where you unlock new skills by buying them with skill points. And the skills cost different amounts, which is interesting. I wonder why... I, know, I noticed that you can tell here the elite skills tend to cost more than the basic skills. But I'm not sure why skills within the same area, like utility skills, would cost different amounts... Can you guys think of any reason? Well, I, I mean, skills have to have some sort of scaling with how powerful they are. Yeah, I would say no, like the, the higher damage skills probably cost more. I'll say like the higher level ones. So but they could ideally, be utility there skills, isn't a but... higher level one per se because you're supposed to be able to use any of these utility skills when you're level 80. They're all supposed to be useful in some way or another. Right? Yeah. It's not supposed to be, okay, now that I'm level 70, I'm going to use these new set of skills that are more powerful than the old ones. They're all supposed to scale in how useful they are as you level up. So that's why I'm kind of confused. And if you'd say, oh, well, that's based on, you know, how powerful, maybe it's based on difficulty, how difficult it is to execute this particular, because that would kind of make sense. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. I, I don't know. I still feel like if a skill is, is more powerful, it maybe it, not in a damage sense, but in the way it can be used, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a harder utility skill to use. It just might mean that you could gain, it's more beneficial to use in a certain situation. Well, sounds yeah, like I just imbalanced to me. That's what sounds like what you're describing. Well, not necessarily imbalanced, but I mean, it's I, I don't know. I just I don't know that much about it, and I can't tell what each skill is doing or why. It's, well, certainly, it, yeah. I mean, we it, it might be more apparent if I could like hover over these and see what they all did and try to figure out why these are seven and these are six. Like then AOEs cost more. Something maybe like that. maybe that's it. But uh, it's interesting because if you look at the elites, one of these costs ten, and the last one costs fourteen. But that doesn't mean that you have to get the last one last. You could just save up four more skill points yeah. before and buy the last one first, which is why I can't figure out why some of them cost more. It's a very interesting well, thing. Does the, does the chat room have any idea? I'm going to look in the chat room here. Due to strength slash usefulness. See, other people are saying strength usefulness, but if some of them are more useful or more powerful than the others, then the game has failed at one of the underlying you know, concepts that it's trying to promote here. These utility skills, you're supposed to choose three of them and slot them into these three slots here, and you're supposed to use, you're supposed to basically make that choice along with your healing and utility, or your healing and elite choice, along with your choice of which two weapons to bring into combat, and that'll be a single build, quote-unquote, I guess you could say. And 
I don't think any specific build or set of skills is supposed to be any more powerful than any other, ideally. Obviously, that's probably not going to be the case right away. There are going to be some overpowered things. People are going to find something to exploit. But I, in an no, ideal but, world, but they should all be equal, quote-unquote, with each other. They should well, all be compelling choices. There you go. Yeah, but so let's say there's one elite skill that turns you into a bear. You know, like that's pretty basic. Let's say there's another elite skill that turns you into a bear and helps all your teammates around you. Maybe it's not good in certain scenarios as opposed to other scenarios. Yeah. But it's just it, because it can do more, maybe that's why it costs more to get it. Well, like, for example, the two elementalist elite skills that we know of, one of them's a tornado and the other one is summoning a, summoning a great fiery sword. I mean, the great fiery sword might do more damage, but the whirlwind does a lot of AoE damage. So you could probably say that the whirlwind would be a lot more useful when you're in a dungeon that's got a lot of mobs, where summoning a massive fiery greatsword might be better in PvP when you're, like, trying to take down a player that you can't quite kill. So... It, yeah, I think it's situational. It might not necessarily be strength, but it is obvious that some of the moves actually do more damage than others from skill websites that I've used. It does say how much damage they do, so I think it could just be based on damage and how good these skills are. Yeah, it's, it's something that we're just going to have to keep speculating on, I guess. But as you can see, this is a pretty nice interface here, and they cost... And we didn't really mention how the skill points are acquired, so unlike most other games, you don't just get the skill points for leveling up. You have to go out and find them in the world, and presumably, because this is sort of a core mechanic, you could probably get directions to the nearest skill point, or somebody could say, yes, you must travel into the wilds and find this thing over there, you know, and, and you know, battle a terrible bear in order to acquire a skill point, or go find an ancient tome and read through that to acquire a skill point, or get training from an yeah. old Jedi master dude, and you know, whatever. <laughs> Wait, that's the wrong game, Yeah, right? sorry, wrong game. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but the idea being, and they go on to discuss this in length, and the blog is pretty interesting, they had this system in there for traits, basically, but they would be very class-specific. So the warrior would go out for a class-specific quest to go and get this trait, which is not entirely unlike the special paladin quests in WoW or the special shaman quest to get your totems, right? And I really liked those quests. They kind of were... They were, they were kind of cool. They were different, and they were like you were earning your stripes, and they were... Very, they had a lot of narrative to them. I liked them. I, I don't know. Did you guys ever go to any of those? Those are one yeah. of the few quests that I did like in WoW, were the ones that did have a little story to them. It wasn't just go and kill something or gather something. It, it might have been that sort of like along the chain, but at least, I don't know, you felt more, you had more of a purpose to it. Yeah, I mean, they, they mentioned in, uh, in the little blog post that I read that, uh, the whole purpose of, of it being a skill challenge as opposed to profession challenges, which is what they were originally going to do, is the fact that profession challenges, when you're in a group, tend to pull people apart. Where mm -hmm. if you're an elementalist running with a necromancer, the elementalist wants to leave and run to the other side of the continent to do one thing, while the necromancer wants to go do his somewhere else. So the purpose of these skill challenges instead of profession challenges is to try to keep people together to accomplish these things. Exactly. It lets everybody go and do the skill challenge, and then they can spend those skills on their class-specific things, those skill points. So I certainly was happy to read about that. That puts a really a lot of thought into it. And then they had a picture of their G-Star booth, which, geez, how much money must NCSoft be spending on these things to promote know, the game? It, like, they look insane. Like, I just want to go just for the booth, like, not even to play. Like, it looks so good. Yeah, I mean... Just, just I mean, looking at the art on the walls, like those giant massive posters must cost maybe 10000 at least a piece. They're huge. Well, realistically, how much, you know, how much advertising, they don't have any commercials, anything like that. All the advertising is at these conventions. Yeah. Yeah. So if that's all the money you're spending on conventions, you, you know, you're probably actually saving money in the long run. Yeah, true. Considering like TV advertisements cost thousands and thousands, so true enough. Yeah, true enough. So and we all know uh... gamers don't watch TV. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, not at all. Not at all. All right, so let's uh, from there move right on to the other blog update. Uh, this is the one on the cinematic conversations. Did you guys read through this? And I say read, I mean watch the videos that were connected here. 
Yep. I've not actually read the blog or the videos on here, but I've seen some YouTube videos on the new cinematics. But they yeah. are much, much better than they were in uh, the previous. Don't you think demos. the male one? The male one oh, is yeah. a lot longer than the female one. Mm -hmm. Like I think that's odd that the female one goes so quickly, and then the male one like lasts really long. Yeah, that's. I, I think that's true. I don't I know if that's just events, the, the, yeah different different quests. The yeah, ones that's that just they situational. Yeah, I think that's the case there. Um, but they're definitely, and, and, and it wouldn't be very good quality if I played it right now for people watching. This would be watching a video that was being downloaded to me from YouTube, uploaded to Twitch TV <laughs> to stream there, <laughs> and then downloaded to their computer. So the quality would not be doing them justice. But go to the uh, arena.net blog, arena.net slash blog, and it's the first post there right now. You can check it out. But I have to say they are a massive step above what they were previous. I was kind of disappointed by the quality of them that I'd seen before. And for those of you who don't know, the cinematic conversations are basically little cutscenes that are usually involved in, a pers in your personal story quests, but I assume they could probably be used in other parts of the game, probably in dungeons and things like that, where your character is speaking to someone else and maybe you're making dialogue choices and things like that. It sort of brings up a, a 3D model of your character and a 3D model of the NPC you're talking to, and then has a sort of, um, what is that, a, a, some art in the background to show where you are, and then, and then the characters will move and emote, and, and their lips were all synced up now, whereas in the past they were just kind of doing generic animations all the time, and the voices were not connected to the models at all. Now the characters are making emotional motions like when the character seems confused he'll put his hand to his head and kind of scratch his head or the other character when she you know is asking a question will sort of narrow her eyes and it's just phenomenally better yeah they're a lot more detailed it's nicer seeing them up close and seeing everything as opposed to being zoomed out and not really being able to tell what's going on yep yep not too much to say it's about this nice. other than they just nice. look awesome <laughs> really it's pretty pretty mind-blowing seeing how much work goes into just deciding how a guy's gonna move when he's angry yeah yeah, yeah it kind of reminds me I don't know uh, back when TF2 was being made for the first time they talked about sort of that was the first time we'd heard of sort of animations meshing together was what Valve was sort of discussing the idea of you could have um, you know, a tank throwing or, or grenade throwing animation, and if a guy is sort of jumping over a wall and throwing it, that it, those two animations would mesh together. And that's something they're talking about in this blog is they'll have a default sort of animation for when they're angry or an animation for when they're scared, and then they could mesh that together with the guy, you know, pointing with his hand. That hand animation could be completely could be used on any of the other idle animations and it will automatically mesh and look natural and you don't have to recut the I'm pointing at you animation with a scared guy and with an angry guy and with a you know happy guy or whatever so that sort of that technology and there's some interesting things in the blog there about that but it was a, I, I thought it was an interesting read yeah Battlefield 3 is incorporating some similar technology it's one of the new yep. innovations that's going on right now all right, checking into the chat room here. How you guys doing? I've been uh, staring at the blog post, <laughs> so I didn't get to see if anybody's saying anything interesting. I'm depending upon you, my loyal viewers, to tell me what I'm doing wrong. Okay, so let's move on to the next part of the show here. It's the roundtable time. Uh, let's talk about MMO economies. So, anybody, what, what, what is your experience? Has anybody really, like, played the economy heavily in any MMO in the past? I would say like the biggest I like played in economy was when I played Rift and it was really, really noticeable if you were on like a low pop server compared to people on high pop servers. And I think like in regards to prices and things like that on the auction house, like you definitely pay if you're on a low pop server, um, you pay more for things as obviously there's less people farming them and things like that. And that's probably the biggest thing that has affected me in games probably is paying for things. <laughs> <laughs> for me I have to say that my wow experience got a significantly better when I found the add-on auctioneer which yeah. would yeah. keep track of 
powerful. You know, <laughs> they, they just do a scan all the time, and it would keep track of what the average, you know, cost was for this item, and it would tell you, no, don't sell that 20 iron ore right now, because it's currently, fl the market is flooded. If you come back, you'll make an extra gold per stack or something like that. And that allowed me to just have so much more fun because for the longest time, I was strapped for cash. I had no idea what to sell anything at. I had no idea what I should sell. When I got Auctioneer, it basically blew my mind how much stuff I could put on the auction house and actually make money at. And it was so much smoother and easier to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for sure. I, like, I, I got Auctioneer myself and... I, before that, like I never ever used the auction house because I just could not be bothered to type in prices. And I think for a lot of people it was laziness, but mm -hmm. it kind of ruined it for the big auction people who made a lot of money and worked out for themselves. So I felt bad for them when you know the add-on came out. But <laughs> yeah, it was kind it, of a democratizing <laughs> effect. It's a, it was a really interesting sort of sociological thing. And for those of you that don't know, the auctioneer add-on essentially would scan the auction house and make a note of every price of every item on the auction house and put it into a database on your computer. And then you go back the next day and you scan again and you go back the next day and you scan again and it builds up a database of what the average price for an item, for any all of the items in the auction house is. So that when you go back, it automatically, when you, when you, you just click an item and say, I wanna sell this and auctioneer will say, Oh, well, now's a good time to sell that. Here's what you should sell it for right now. Boom, done. You just slide it over, hit go, and it chooses the prices for you, and it does a good job choosing the prices, and the stuff sells. And yeah. so it basically made it so much faster and easier to do that, whereas before, people would be like, <clears throat> all right, let me see. Yesterday, I had uh, <laughs> sold two stacks at 20 gold, and uh, today the price see is up it. to 19 gold, and doing the calculations by hand, but there were tons of people make it. There was a few people that were willing to do that, that made a lot of money off of it because nobody else was willing to put in that time. Yeah, yeah you yeah, had I, to I, like invest so much time. My, my wow experience is I have 20 stacks of copper. Let me go see what the highest bid is, and I'll just put it at like two copper below that. And I just kept on <laughs> yeah. doing that yeah. over and over again because, I mean, to be honest, you know, I, when I played WoW or any other MMO, I spend, I like to spend most of my time actually, you know, questing PvP, you know, playing that aspect of the game. And I never got big into the economies mm -hmm. because I had to invest so much time into, you know, leveling my character. But I, I'm excited for Guild Wars because I feel like I'm not going to have to devote as much time to leveling. So I'll have more time to explore the economics of the game itself when in other games I never really had that opportunity. The only thing like I'm concerned about really is um, with how the servers work. Obviously economy differs in other games depending on what server you're on and it's really important so your server could have a great economy and everyone's kind of fair and there's a lot of people farming things so there's a, a great demand for everything but on some other servers there could be no one farming these items and they could be really expensive so I think when you can just change servers whenever you like and like with the global auction house as someone said in the chat it's going to drastically change the economy and it's going to be a lot different to other games yeah alright so why don't we talk about the uh, the interesting changes that sort of Guild Wars 2 is making to their economy compared to others so, specifically, the fact that in the Guild Wars 2 economy is going to be a global economy. It's not going to be a per server, as you mentioned. That had a real big problem, like you mentioned, especially in Rift, where depending upon what server you were on, you know, that, yeah. that changed what you were paying for things, and it changed your gaming experience as a result. If you couldn't afford that, you know, plus two sort of smiting, then you couldn't, uh, you couldn't, you couldn't have as much fun because things would be more challenging, too difficult, whatever. Now, yeah. they're going to have a global auction house, and it's going to have the ability to do sell orders, which is sort of the typical, you know, eBay style auction and or, you know, buy it now system that most people are used to. But it's also going to have buy orders, which are essentially the opposite of sell orders. And EVE Online is the only MMO that I know of that has used that system. And it's essentially the idea that if you want to sell a stack of 20 ore, for example, you'd go up to the thing and say, I have 20 ore, I'm willing to sell it for this price. 
a buy order is exactly the opposite. You'd say, I want to buy 15 order and I'm willing to buy it at no more than this price. And you, most of the time, those two prices will be just slightly apart so that one person would be willing to buy for five gold and the lowest somebody would be willing to sell for, it'd be six gold, for example. And what that allows you to do is no matter whether you're the buyer or the seller, you basically choose whether you want to have the money now and have less money or get more money later. And it's a very simple process. If you're, the, if you're selling, I've got 20 ore. I could sell it to that guy who's offering it for five. Or I could put up my order for six and wait for somebody else to buy it for six later. So it gives the people selling things the ability to get stuff instantaneously, whereas in the past, in other MMOs, usually the only option was only the buyer gets things instantaneously. So it's really just an all-around bonus as far as I can tell. Is it, can anybody think of anything bad that can happen through that system? I, I see the, the okay. having, having uh, a single global economy could have its ups and downs because at the same time that yes you have that many more people participating in it that means you have that many more people that'll try and undercut everyone else or if people who really want to play the economy now they have that many more people to compete against just from yeah, looking think, at it like a broad perspective yeah so you've always got instead of having two people on your server that do dual crafting, you're going to have like 25 people over different servers. So there is going to be more to buy, which I think is good, but obviously then there's more people buying it. So I think it will kind of level out. It will end up just feeling like we're on one server with one auction house because, you know, on the grand scale of things, like the percentage of things to buy will go up, but the percentage of players buying it will also go up. So I think it will just kind of stay the same, like it will plateau. So... I think I just think that the the economics in general is such an interesting design in a game because realistically the developers they don't have that much say over it, you know? If people want to sell stuff for way more than it's worth, people are going to sell stuff and if people buy it, then people are going to keep selling it. But the developers yeah, exactly. can't do too much about it. So it's very interesting that really, you know, it's time will tell how things are going to play out. And also, with like crafting, obviously, we're not 100% sure like how often things like nodes will drop and like, you know, how easy it is to level up crafting. But in regards to like gear and things, like, as they said with dungeons, I th nothing will drop that you don't need and you kind of get it via points at the end of a dungeon. So I don't think we'll see actually much gear on the auction house. So I think it might all just be like crafting materials and, you know, gear that's been yeah. crafted. So. You know, it might work out that everything sells quite cheap, or it could be that crafting takes like a hell of a long time to level and everything's really expensive, but it could go one I way just, or the other. I'm just really excited in general for the global economy because I don't know if anybody else noticed, but in WoW, when I would get destroyed in PvP from other realms, you go to one of those realms and you, you realize like I'm selling a stack of copper for, for barely anything in my realm, and you go there and you have people paying, you know, like 25 gold for a stack of copper. Like, if you have those independent economies, I feel like it can really skew how fast and how easy it is to, to obtain more gear, to get yourself through the levels. I mean, so I think especially with World v. World being such a big part, I think the global economy is going to be hugely important. Otherwise, you would, have, you would have certain worlds just slingshotting themselves in front of other people once their economies progressed. Yeah. That's but, at the same, but at the same time, this kind of ties into crafting and in that... Um, in, in that all the gear that you craft is not is no better than gear that's going to drop or gear you get from dungeons. Yeah, wise. that's true. All it is is it looks cosmetically different. So now, you know, people in WoW were crafting gear and doing everything to have this, you know, these, these tunes that had outrageous gear and outrageous enchants and everything. Um, I feel like that that's not as big of an, a problem in Guild Wars 2 because all the gear... It's all relative, you know. So you can, you're not going to have someone who's strictly crafting that's going to have gear that's that much better than you because all the stats are going to be about the same. The only thing that's different is the way they look. So what's really interesting, and, and another bonus to 
the advantage, another advantage of having a larger population in the economy is that in the smaller servers, a few people could sort of like monopolize a corner. They could say, oh, well, there's, there's only 30 thorium bars on the market. I'll just buy all of them and then mark the price up four times and screw all y'all. But that isn't possible. Yeah. That's not going to be possible. So the question, though, is with so many people supplying, are you going to be able to sell? I mean, you must be able to because that means there's going to be more people buying, too. I just think that if, if it comes to the point where you're getting that frustrated where someone's trying to monopolize something, you might just be like, well, you know, what am I really buying this material for? I'm buying the material so I can craft something that I could use. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you skip the crafting process and just go run a dungeon instead or just do some quests instead, you're still going to find gear that's just as good as something you could craft. So, I mean, it's kind of the way I see Guild Wars is that they keep on giving people different options to go about what they want to do. Yeah, so you can get the gear for PvP, PvE, or craft it. So you've got the options. If you, you don't exactly. have time to run the dungeons and you've got, you've got gold or whatever the currency is going to be, you could just you know, pay to craft it. Or if you don't have the gold, you can just go run dungeons and spend time and get the gear. So I think it's quite equal opportunities for everyone, depending on what you like best. So the yeah. people who want to economize and get lots of money and stuff and get the gear, they can just pay for it. Whereas the people who like PvE and want to run dungeons can just get it that way. And I think that's quite good. Yeah, so now let's talk about just economies in general for a moment. What's really interesting and obviously different about MMO economies is that they're inherently broken. And by that I mean wealth is constantly being created infinitely. Like, when you go out there, monsters are spawning into the world and they have gold on them. So new gold is being created all of the time. And you can't have that process stop. You can't say, we're going to have three trillion gold in this game and there will be no more. Because then <laughs> no the new gold. person that joins, he kills a mom and he goes, what? There's nothing here. What the hell? Why didn't this boar have any gold on him? <laughs> right? So obviously that's where the gold sink comes in. And the most easiest example, I guess, would be at the top of my head would be the World of Warcraft. The, uh, the, the um, what you call it, the system, um, durability system. That's what I'm looking for, the durability system, where as you fight things, you're going to get gold from killing them, you're, but then you are also going to slowly have your weapons degrade, and you're going to have to use pay gold back into the system in order to, uh, you know, yeah. get those durabilities. Now, the problem with that is if the money sink is equal to the amount that's being produced that nobody will ever make any money, right? Because you'll wind up getting 30 gold from your process out in the killing fields and you come back and you have to pay 30 gold to the durability guy or 20 gold to the durability guy and then 10 gold to the flight master to get you from one place to another. So you've got these money sinks in place to keep the inflation from going crazy, but the inflation has to be there or else nobody will ever get any gold. It's a weird well, catch-22. Well, what about quests, too? I mean... Quests give you rewards, get, too, yeah. You get gold from quests, or I'm, I'm guessing, you know, even dynamic events, yeah. gold, might, gold might be mm -hmm. something you get, or dungeons as well. I mean, like you said, the, I think it's inherently broken as well, it, also because, let's face it, you're, you're playing with virtual money. You know, right. if, if you, you'll throw it away at whatever you want. It's not... I, I don't feel like gold is that critical you know i don't know like people i've known in wow they've had like a hundred k gold and then they've bought a pet or a mount for like 20k and they're like they feel guilty about it they're like oh, i spent so much gold and it's like <laughs> but you can make it back like it's not like you've just bought a house in real life and you've spent yeah. all that money and you're literally broke like you don't, you don't have, have to go sweep, that... sweep the streets to get your money. Yeah, like, <laughs> that doesn't feed you. Like, you can just earn that gold back. But people do get possessive over it. And, like, they, I think it is, like, their currency in real life. They do, like, really value their gold. But I don't know. There are a lot of ways to earn gold. But it depends how well the crafting is. If it's just something that's, like, optional, 
um, because of all these other ways to get gear, then you know crafting might not be that important and we won't need to do it. Therefore, people won't make much money. However, if things like the food buffs become necessary for like PvP and end game dungeons, then people will make a lot of money selling food because I know in every yeah. other game they have. I think also that I think that gold is I think it'll only really be critical once you're at the max level because I think once you get to a certain point now you have the gear that you want and now you just want to look cool or you want to you know you want to go and get that stuff that really makes you stand out and that's when you might be crafting things or buying things to go do more end game kind of stuff all right, but. so let's let's turn away from generic economy now, and we'll talk about everything that we know about the crafting and gear customization systems in uh, in Guild Wars Two. This is for basically for people who who don't know much about it yet or haven't been following the game to that extent. We're going to try and go over everything that that has been released and that you can figure out. So basically, there are eight crafting professions, and those go as follows see if i can remember it off the top of my head here correct me if i'm wrong but i know there are um one for melee weapons one i got for... the wiki up if you want me to just read i'll it. go ahead and read it off the wiki then i was gonna test myself um, but <laughs> but you want you want to test yourself and i'll i'll let you all right know yeah correct right me all right okay you got one for melee weapons you got one for ranged weapons like bows and and guns if i'm mistaken, if not mistaken and then one for magical weapons staffs and scepters and then you have one for each armor type, light armor, medium armor, and heavy armor. And yep. then we have potion making and, oh, what am I missing? Is there some kind of jewel crafting? Yeah, but it's more, it's not potion, it's uh, cooking. Cooking, there we go. So uh, the official names are weaponsmiths, huntsmen, <laughs> um, artificers, artificers, fissers, Artificers, armorsmiths, yeah. leather workers, tailors, jewel crafters, cooks. So, I mean, pretty, pretty straightforward. So, the differences compared to other games that you may have played is that in, in Guild Wars 2, and, and you know, by the way, that when I say it like that, what I mean is this is how it's different from WoW, <laughs> because that's the one everybody compares it to. The major difference is, similar to WoW, you can have two of these professions available at any time. You may notice yep. that there are no gathering professions. That's because everybody can gather all the things. Basically, all, the all of the things. You can. There are mining <laughs> nodes throughout the world. There are herbs that you can pick. But, again, sticking with their concept of you don't want to hate other players being around you. They don't want to reinforce. They don't have any mechanics that reinforce get away from me. So what that means for crafting is every node out there that has crafting materials that you can harvest is instanced for each player. So if we're going along questing together and we see a mining node that has some copper or something, we don't have to fight or roll or, or, or try to, okay, you go, I'll get the next one. We both get to go and harvest from it because it's instanced for you and it's instanced for me, which is quite frankly genius and why hasn't that been done before? I know. That, I hated it. Like when you're trying to level up, especially when you're lower level or you've got to end game and you're trying to level up a crafting profession and you need this material and you're running around the low level zones on your mount trying to find it and people are just swooping in on their faster mounts than you because they've got more <laughs> gold and they steal it from you and like I literally want to stab them in the eyeball and <laughs> like I think this will be a lot better. <laughs> the, the, when I, in, uh, when Cataclysm came out and I I got to like my max level when I was trying to level up um, my my blacksmithing it was like it was like four o'clock in the morning or something and I figured no one would be up so now this is a great time to fly around and find all those nodes so I went in this one area I'm just flying in a circle and I'd see on my little map the little like ping show up and I'd be like all right let me fly over there and then I get over there and it's gone <laughs> and then I realized that there was two people in the entire zone it was me and this other guy and i was literally following his path trying to find the notes <laughs> oh, no. uh, so then so then i like started flying you know the opposite direction trying to trying to cut him off <laughs> to fight for these nodes <laughs> and it was the most frustrating thing that's what we know? call emergent <laughs> gameplay vega that's, that's a good ridiculous. thing <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> Uh, moving on to other interesting pieces of crafting, uh, they're all going to have skill levels, and you can have two of them at a time, like I mentioned. However, unlike WoW, if you're 
say, a weaponsmith that can craft melee weapons and an armorsmith that can do heavy armor. And you decide, you know, I've, I don't really need any more armor. I've got some good armor. I've got some good weapons. But what I could use is maybe some food and, and jewelry. You can actually stop leveling up weaponsmithing and armorsmithing and move over to jewel crafting and cooking and not lose your progress in weaponsmithing and armorsmithing. Now, you won't just be able to switch back and forth because they want people to specialize in some to some degree to make it worthwhile to have a guild where, you know, okay, I'll do the armorsmithing and my friend Jay is going to do the leather working and somebody else is going to do the tailoring and sort of that's cuz if you can do everything yourself then why have any trade, right? So to promote an economy, they want to have specialization, which means switching from any two profession uh, crafting to any other two crafting disciplines is going to cost some money. There's another money sink there, uh, and it will be probably cost prohibitive to just casually switch between them. But at the very least, you can try them out and and you know pay a little gold to switch to something else if you don't like you know one set of crafting things that you're doing. So again, another great tiny little thing that they can do that is just put them light years ahead in my mind. Yeah, exactly, especially with the fact that then if you decide, oh crap, I made the wrong decision, and you want to go back to your original crafting, it saves how much like you leveled up and skilled up in that profession, mm -hmm. or, ugh, crafting discipline even. And um, I think that's really good <laughs> because there's so many times when, you know, you get to endgame and people are like, you need to have food and you need to have weaponsmithing, and then you realize like, that's rubbish for me. Like, I want jewel crafting and I want whatever. And it's good that you can switch around. And if you wanted to, you could literally level up all eight of the crafting disciplines and just switch between them. And I previously discussed it before, and I think that's really good for guild leaders especially. For example, if you're, you know, your guild are leveling up and you get quite a lot of new members, you can help them out by just literally switching between the different professions and, you know, crafting those things for them. Yeah, it's probably going to cost a lot. It'd be cost prohibitive to just switch constantly, you know, within a small amount of time. But um, not unless you're working that economy. And you're <laughs> rich. I just want the question mark like, guy, the question mark guy, to show up in the corner and say, "Did you know ArenaNet's giving out gold for free? <laughs> I'll tell you all the secrets about how you can get gold from the auction house. It's that simple." Oh man, that guy's awesome. 90s icon. So let's move on now. A couple more minutes here. Let's talk some more about the interesting things going on in the crafting environment. So the crafting system, ha every, every crafting discipline has a node that is, sorry, a node, a skill level of up to 400 skill points that you slowly level up. Now, also, another example, last week we were talking about random number generators in, in combat. Now, Another really annoying random number generator in World of Warcraft, for example, was the way that you skilled up your crafting professions in that game. Basically, every time you crash something, you would have a percent chance to gain a skill point. Which means sometimes if you had some really bad luck, you could be crafting over and over again trying to get that last point you need to start crafting new things. And it just doesn't happen. And you have to go buy another freaking stack of tin when you'll never need tin again. And, oh, damn it, I but hate that system. And you only need one and you get it and you're like, oh, now I have to sell 19 tin. Exactly. Yes, so, it felt so good when you got like those random like three points in a row. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So unlike that system, every time you craft something, assuming it's anywhere near your current skill level, uh, you will get some experience towards the next level. So it's not a random amount. It's always going to be, if you are, let's say, pick a random number. If you're at level 70 and you're crafting an item that was set for a level 65 or whatever, as you level it up, you're, you're going to get you know 20 XP, 30 XP or what have you towards your next thing. So there's not a chance of getting nothing. So every time you craft something, it'll get you closer towards your next skill point. And I believe they said the way that they are going to prevent you from skilling all the way up really easily and quickly is by hiding the, um, the, the high-level materials in the high-level areas. So you can't just craft your way all the, all the way to 400 with a level 1 character unless you go and collect a bunch of stuff in the high-level characters. I could be wrong about that. I'm trying to remember from a single interview from a while back. Um, let's see. What else do we have on here? Uh, unique appearances, uh, as you mentioned before, the crafting, uh, the things that you craft, uh, uh, weapons and armor anyway, are going to be unique but similar or the same stats as other gear of that level. 
So nothing, they're not supposed to be superior, they're supposed to be unique and make you look more badass. The other thing is that they've tried to design the system so that it, at, at any given level, you are basically creating useful items. Because in WoW, we know that was never the case when you were leveling up. Oh, oh, let me craft this helmet that's not nearly as good as the one I'm wearing. Or maybe these pants that I could have used ten levels ago. Or maybe this chest armor that is still not good enough for me right now. So they at least have said that when you're crafting things, they will be immediately useful to you once you're done crafting them, if you're crafting at, you know, the correct level. Yeah, I never, I never actually re realized that that when you were leveling up, you were never using the stuff you were used, you were crafting. But then when you got to the max level, the stuff that would actually be useful to you is so damn hard to craft. Yeah, basically the crafting professions were never used. I mean, you just vendor it basically. It's, no, actually, what would be true is you'd craft it and then sell it on the auction house to somebody four levels lower than you that could use it, essentially. Yeah, yeah. There were just a few items that would just get crazy on the auction house, and everything else was worthless. Pretty much. That's how it went. There'd be like one item that's used in a quest, that one like little copper musket yep. or whatever it's a quest for the wetlands. <laughs> yeah. and those, or the free action awful, potions. Like... For a long time in WoW, it was free action <laughs> potions. I would make so much money with those because I, 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 when, as soon as the, uh, the Warsong Gulch came out and they were doing Capture the Flag, I would go in there on my shaman, and I, I used my alchemy, so I had a bunch of free action potions. I grabbed the flag, use a free action potion, which means, you, you know, as soon as they try to yeah. snare me, free action potion. Can't stop me. Then I hit, uh, I had a trinket stopwatch that would give me sprint for, like, ten seconds or something. And I'd zoom out of there. We were inside, so they couldn't mount up to try and catch me. So I was unsnareable and fast. And by the time I got out, they were way far behind, and I'd get on my mount and run away. Man, those were good and good times. <laughs> Thank oh, you for the action potions. potions were one of my favorites for confusing people in PvP. All right. Uh, so let's see. We're going to wrap it up here. So what else are we coming down on? The discovery system. Now, this is interesting. Basically, there aren't necessarily recipes that you will need to find in the world, though I believe that is also the case. You can instead choose to try and discover... Um, new items to craft by putting things randomly together, kind of like the Skyrim system, actually, um, but not exactly. So you put a bunch of things together, and it'll say, hey, this can maybe craft something, and you hit go, and it'll say, yes, you've learned a new recipe, and from then on, you know exactly how to craft this thing. So uh, there was a couple of small videos about that, but there haven't been a huge amount of depth. Does anybody else have anything to add about the discovery system? What are your thoughts? <laughs> I'm just wondering if you could find someone who's a higher level than you and just have them give you recipes and if those will oh, work. Oh, dude, you're just going to be able to go to a wiki and then <laughs> get all the recipes <laughs> for yourself if you wanted to. The discovery system is there for people who feel like not cheating, basically. <laughs> I, what it's, is it's, it's, it's to keep people from having a monopoly on a particular recipe. That too. So, that uh, it frees up the market because they did the same thing in EVE Online when Tech 2 recipes were this huge monopoly and if you could make Tech 2 advanced capacitors you were like you were just rolling an ISK you had more money than you knew what to do with because no one else on the entire 65,000 player game world can make them now everybody can find it eventually and no one person is going to have that one special recipe <laughs> I kind of I like the discovery system because if I am going to have to go run around getting something I'd rather be getting you know recipes as opposed to spending a ton of time trying to grind out you know harvesting and stuff like that. I yeah. like I like the little discovery that thing that they're talking about. It's, it, I especially like that it's kind of optional because if you just know that when I take you know iron and put it with this leather it makes a thing because you can go to a wiki yeah. and find that out, then you yeah. can kind of skip the discovery process if you want to, but for the people who like to be immersed, like, I'll probably use the discovery system, because I like the, the concept. It's kind of fun to, to find new things as you're going, and it kind of it does help you a little bit to try and give you a, a hint of what can and can't go together. Anyway, uh, moving on, let's talk about gear. Now, we kind of br briefly maybe talked about this on another show at some point, but the gear system is very interesting. <laughs> And I am. I know. I want to show the notes to people. This is, okay, they can <laughs> see right, what we're talking. Just, about. Sure. <laughs> Vegas, like, Psst, you're showing them the behind the curtain part. Trade secrets. The man behind the curtain. Pay so, no attention. Yeah. Pay no attention. So, 
<laughs> what Turn really, your eyes. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things that really sort of sold me on Guild Wars 2 was the idea that at max level, when you get to 80, or at any point in between all the way up there, but specifically when you're at 80, you don't have to chase the gear treadmill. You don't have to keep trying to get the better gear, the better gear, the better gear. Very shortly after getting to level 80, you're going to get you sort of know the, the gear with the best stats for your character. There's probably going to be a couple different sets of gear that, you know, will, will be good for your class or your build or what have you, and you'll be able to acquire those fairly quickly. But, if you want to, you can then try to acquire unique looking gear. And that's where transmutation stones come in. Because if you get a transmutation stone, you can take the stats from one gear and copy it onto another piece of gear that looks cooler. So you can get, you know, the stats from a cool chest piece and a different leg piece that looks good with your thing and then etc. And sort of copy the stats over to the thing that aesthetically looks good but had crappy stats. So I really like that concept. Well, yeah, I've, I, I, love, I love that, definitely. Not, not to mention the fact that you can dye things with the armor dyes and sort of, you know, set yourself even more unique. Um, it just, it sounds like it's going to be very cool to customize your character. What was that? I think they said three colors per piece of armor? Yep. Yeah, Some for the of bigger them don't pieces, have that yeah. many channels, but most do. Yeah. yeah, I think like boots and gloves only have two, but like, yeah, oh, most have about three. And I think certain individual pieces don't have as many as well, where it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, like the one that's like a a snakeskin crazy robe that they showed off at one point. Um, so let's see. Um, there's also the way that sets work is you get to basically have slots in the armor, if I remember correctly, um, that allow you to input different bonuses to you know armor that can create a set bonus when you put them all together. Something like that. Does anybody uh, remember? I, yeah, I really like that idea. Uh um, in Rift after one of the pat like major patches and basically you didn't have any stats on your gear and you basically just bought these kind of little orbs that you slotted into one of your slots that were specifically for set bonuses. So depending on what um, spec you wanted to play most, you could put a slot in there. So you could buy um, one of these set bonus items for each one of the specs that you play, and you could just switch them out depending on what you're going to do. So you'd have a PvP one or a, a PvE one, and you could still have the same gear, but your set bonus would change depending on what item you had. I thought it was really good because you didn't have to get loads of different gear. Yeah, you could just interchange those bonuses. Mm -hmm. It's basically like a secondary piece of gear. It's similar to the implant system in uh, EVE Online where they have a mm -hmm. subset of implants which are set implants. They yep. give you additional bonuses, but it's not your actual ship or your gear in this case. Yep, so that's, that's pretty much all that we know for a fact that I can think of about uh, gear and crafting. Um, any final... Um, comments from you guys about economy or anything uh, in general? Don't undercut me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> All do. right. So, uh, a couple of housekeeping notes here. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a uh, sort of book review of The Ghosts of Ascalon, which is the first Guild Wars 2 book that sort of gives you the backstory that leads up to Guild Wars 2, the universe that Guild Wars 2 is set in now. So I'm going to be uh, reading through that and we're going to give uh, sort of a two-segment review. One will be no spoilers and then in the end we'll do another spoiler review sort of a thing where we'll talk more deeply about you know the, the, the book itself. So hopefully we'll have some other hosts on the show here that are going to join me in, in reading the book and we'll give you the, the, the skivvy on whether you should read it. But if you know you want to read it yourself, then you can sort of participate in the conversation and uh, tell us all about it. So the other thing I wanted to let everybody know is remember, you can send us feedback, feedback at 
talesoftyria.com. If you've got some ideas, if you've got questions you want answered on the show, we're kind of planning a Q&A segment for the future. So if you've got questions about the game that you want to be answered, or even speculative questions like, do you think that they should add new levels after uh, expansions come out, or should there be new content? What should they do? That kind of a thing. You can ask those questions. We'll try to answer them. It'll be great. Feedback at talesoftyria.com is how you get a hold of us. And um, I think with that, that's kind of it. All right. Woo-hoo! So, if I could get my audio playing, that would help us end the show. But if I can't, the show must go on, I think is the uh, phrase. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> I don't think... <laughs> 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 I don't think you can fool anybody. <laughs> so. In the mental asylum, that is Tales of Tyria. <laughs> All right, there we go. We got it working. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Bye, everyone.